All right. I'm just waiting on. <clears throat> Waiting on Ethan to come on in. He's having a little trouble on the on the stream, but I think we'll have it here shortly. Hi, everybody. Just uh, waiting for Ethan to get get logged in. He's trying some different avenues. Might be a minute or two. I'll stick with us. <clears throat> hey, there's Ethan. I can't hear you. I don't know. Can you guys hear Ethan? Ethan, can you say hello? Oh, wait. Aha! Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh. Can you hear the noise in the background? Was that a gunshot? No, it's probably a firecracker, uh, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, so it's 7 o'clock every night. Uh, in, I'm, I'm in kind of the middle of Manhattan. And at 7 o'clock every night, people on the roofs and everything cheer for the healthcare workers. Um, so for about two to three minutes. So for the first two or three minutes of this interview, you will hear that in the background. I don't know if you can hear it, but yeah. We can, but I think it's cool. I think it's uh, you know, a sign of the times, right? Yeah. So adds to the, the awesomeness of having you here live from New York City. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate so, it. Um, Ethan, if you could just uh, introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about your yourself and um, you know how you got down this road. Sure, sure. Uh, well, my name is Ethan Sachs, and uh, you can probably tell from the little uh, text at the bottom of the screen. And um, I'm a uh, comic book writer. Uh, mainly for Marvel, uh, basically just two, a little bit more than two years in the biz. Before that, I was a uh, newspaper journalist for 20 years at the New York Daily News, and I'm still um, uh, still working at uh, NBC News for uh, part of the week. And uh, yeah, that's not a gunshot, just in case anyone's, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, basically who I am. Cool. What got you into comic books? What was your? Well, so I've, oh, I mean, I've been a lifelong fan. And uh, one of the cool parts of uh, working at the New York Daily News was I, I got the, uh, what they called the geek beat. And that was like comics, Star Wars, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, just everything, you know, lost, all this stuff that I loved anyway. So uh, basically part of my job was, was getting paid to, you know, interview people like George Lucas and things like that. So, um, but I ended up, cause I covered comics for so long. I ended up knowing a lot of the people in the business and uh, I, I owe all credit to Joe Casada, who is a friend of mine for closing in on 20 years. And uh, we were a uh, short version of the story is it was May the 4th, 2016. And uh, like, you know how May the 4th is like a fake Star Wars holiday? Well, sorry. It's, it's, a, a, real, it's a real holiday. real <laughs> holiday. But I mean, it's it's uh, not the kind of holiday you get off of uh, work for is what I meant right, by right. that. Um, so I had interviewed this guy, Paul Blake, who is the actor who played Greedo uh, for a story that, that year in the Daily News. And I remember talking to him about how I was old enough to have seen Star Wars in the original theater when I was four. Mm. And I'd seen it multiple times where uh, Han Solo shot first and then Greedo, you know, basically just dies. And it was obviously altered later uh, so that Greedo shoots first and somehow across the small table misses. So I had asked him, does it bother you that this Greedo has just basically gone out like a punk? Um, and, you know, he had this whole, like, he was really funny. He had this whole shtick about, uh, you know, I know he's got those like, myopic eyes but you know he's obviously in the wrong business and all this kind of stuff but then he said you know in the script it says solo shoots alien so you know he was there he was an eyewitness it, it that's how it happened and so i was thinking about this and i thought wouldn't it be funny if there was a murder investigation 
into the murder of Greedo. And then um, like basically like Rashomon, I don't know if you're familiar with the Kurosawa movie and the, the Japanese story it was based on, but it's basically like a murder in feudal Japan. And it's told from four points of view from like the murder, you know, including the murder victim, but like four points of view and none of the stories match. Um, so I thought that'd be kind of a kind of fun thing. And so we we're at a Met game. I was at a Met game with uh, with Joe. And I was like, hey, do you mind if I pitch a spec script just for fun? Like, I'm not expecting it to get made or or get paid for it or anything. And he was like, sure. But inside, he later confessed to me that he was so short it would be bad. And he didn't want to deal with it. But uh, so anyway, I sent it to him. I was just kind of curious because I, I thought it was funny. And um, long story short, he waited four months and then gets back to me. Uh, and I was – my wife's Japanese and we were – we had come back from Japan from visiting my in-laws and like the plane lands. I turn on my phone and the first email I see is from him. It was the email that changed my life. And he was like, dude, I think you can do this for a living. And that story was never published, but uh, it got me. Uh, then Axel Alonso, who was editor in chief of Marvel at the time, reached out to me. And I mean, it was, it was really like a Cinderella story um, kind of thing. Like just sort of out of nowhere, uh, a pumpkin got, got a comic book gig. But at the same time, uh, the Daily News was was doing um, buyouts. So I had the chance because I'd been there 20 years to get like seven months pay. So that was my chance to change careers, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that anyway, was, that's pretty much what happened. To me and I mean, it was it was really like a Cinderella story um, um, thing. Like just sort of I'm where, hearing. <laughs> uh, a pumpkin got, got a comic book gig. But at the same time. Is uh, that – I can you hear that? That's like uh, – yeah, it sounds I, like a recording. Yeah, okay. It was a lag. Gotcha. Okay, so am I okay to continue? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So anyway, that's the that was my way in, and then like a few months, I did a an eight page story, and then a few months later, uh, this editor Mark Basso was putting together a uh, an old man Hawkeye, a prequel to Old Man Logan, and he reached out to me and said, I think like I read the Greedo script, and I think like like the way you put Easter eggs in and things like that. Like, I think you could do something with this, but uh, I had to pitch my own story and there were a couple other writers sort of circling it too. And that I guess was my big break. So great story, by the way, I, I, I love, I love, I read that. And I also read the old man Logan and um, I, I, I'm, as I get older, <laughs> I, I, it's funny because these characters don't age, right? You know, yeah. the Wolverine's the same guy he was 40 years ago when I was, when I was yeah, reading. And they still have abs. Like you yeah, try, yeah. try being 60, whatever these characters are and still have yeah. abs. Right. You know, that is the superpower right there. Sure. What's some of the uh, tell, uh, more memorable things that have happened to you on this this short journey that you've been on now for the past couple of years? I, I know there's the Stan Lee story about your daughter. Um, <laughs> well, I, sorry, I, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I, I'd like to hear, you know, some of the like standout moments. Well, some of that, like the Stan Lee thing was I got to interview him so many times while I was a reporter. Uh, so some of that you know, like uh, I had some great experiences on that end, but like as far as the comics go, there wasn't. He, isn't he awesome? Like he is so he, awesome. My best memory of him was Toronto Expo. Um, there was a line like a snake around the corner, hundreds and thousands of people, and um, this is like flip phone era, right? Like <laughs> early uh, cell phone. He stopped and high fived, shake hugged or took a picture with every single person in that line waiting to get in the door of the con. It was unbelievable. I got goosebumps um, yeah. just talking about him. He was just amazing. Anyway, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, he really was down to earth. And, you know, I, one of the interviews he said to me, I said, do you ever get tired of being, you know, of, of stop? Because he, he would, I was walking with him at a con and same thing. Like he would stop. If anyone came up to him, he would stop, he would sign it and he would drive his handlers nuts because it's not really safe for an elderly man at that time he was in his eighties, yeah. like going through the, you know, going through a crowded convention, they're trying to get him to like, you know, some, uh, either private room or something. And he's like, I can never get, he was like, I can't ever not do that because I wouldn't be where I am. Every dollar I made is because of people like that. And I, you know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to have any of them, not a single person have a bad, you know, have seen this person they idolized and then get, totally you know um 
you know, passed by or it seemed like he ignored them or anything like that. So that was so important to him. And that, that, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why he was so successful and so beloved for so long. So, Oh, uh, sorry. (laughs) You asked me a question and I totally, that's okay. Uh, So, yeah. So I think like for me, uh, some of the things, well, first of all, like on old man Hawk, I was my first big, Project so getting some of those pages back that I had thought oh by the way uh, a little bit of a serious note because I'm in the middle of New York and the pandemic is going on you will hear ambulances from time to time punctuating I, I apologize we don't have thick windows but uh, so unfortunately that is a grim reminder of what's going on uh, outside um, but on on a better note or a, a, a higher note. Um, uh so yeah so getting those like marco coquetto the artist like getting those that art that was in your head like a vague idea in your head and just seeing it on the page for the first time i mean i i teared up you know yeah that's like, it's big for as a writer because you're you're you don't draw you don't you no know. no and i yeah, yeah and it's you get really, just as really running around up here and and watching them turn that into something yeah um that, yeah, that's super cool. What, what's what been your favorite story run so far that you've been working on? Oh, man, it's like choosing between children. Uh, it's hard that's to, okay. it's I hard to pick. <laughs> you have a favorite kid. <laughs> um, no, so, I, mean, I think like, you know, some of the Star Wars stuff has been amazing for me as somebody who grew up as such a Star Wars fan. And it's been like probably the most biggest cultural touchstone for me. And the cool thing about working in the Star Wars universe in the star wars franchise is everything you do is like canon is like part of the the universe so if you create a character and it gets shot by by chewbacca or something like that happened you know um so uh and then doing doing galaxy's edge with artist will uh sliney was particularly cool because we were kind of working and seeing stuff for the theme park that wasn't out yet it wasn't even built yet Mm. And then uh, Disney flew us down for the opening in Orlando. And so we were kind of treated like rock stars. So that whole experience of so my first really big foray into the Star Wars universe, getting to be a part of of the, um, you know, the the creating things in that universe. Uh, and I got to write Greedo into a story. Um, and then, uh, you know, going to try out the rides while before it even opened to the public. Like that was just an incredible, incredible experience. Yeah. I love like, so I, I, <clears throat> I would have to think like writing your, you know, your Marvel stuff would be, you know, old man, Logan, o- old man, Hawking, you know, that stuff's cool. Cause you are creating something that hasn't been done before. But the cool thing about the star Wars universe is that it's so expansive. There's so much involved that you, like you said, you're literally creating new stuff. I let, you know, um, my, my favorite story was Rogue One because to me it was a story that would have never been told, right? Everybody died. You know, it never would. It's like a war story of heroes that, that, you know, would have never been recognized if somehow this story didn't get out, you know, I, I really loved, and there was cool characters and everything was, was neat. And, but being so expansive, you know, like the, the the so much space in that Star Wars world. There's so much to work with. So many new. The Doctor. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. That Doctor Arpa. Afra. 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 Okay, good. Yeah, that yeah. you heard it from him. <laughs> That's the no worries. Yeah, she's fantastic. Great story. Great, yeah. great. And it's something I never would have imagined. But there's probably the opportunity for a thousand characters like that. You know what I mean? There are. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um... I think what you're going to see in the next few years uh, in all like television, uh, the Project Luminous stuff that's coming out, you know, later this year, the, the novels and the comics and, um, you know, even our small piece of the puzzle uh, is just like you're you're seeing it's not all uh, Skywalker's story, as wonderful as that story is, as that saga has been and, and how many generations of lives it's touched. There's like a lot of different time periods of different you know, uh, CD crime stories and all this kind of stuff that can be told. Right. Um, you know, and, and, uh, uh, so yeah, it's, it's unlike anything else. Cause if you think about it, like the, if you buy a star Wars comic, it tie, it, it's all part of that same universe. So what happens in it matters. And, and, uh, you know, you look at different franchises, like say Harry Potter, 
the books are the books, the movies are the movies and things like that. So it's, it is a unique thing, the Star Wars universe. What'd you think of the, uh, the, the, the show that they just did? A Mandalorian? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I loved it as a fan and, uh, oh. yeah, I got Disney plus the first day it was, was out and, you know, uh, it is amazing. It's, it feel, it has all the, you know, the heft of a, of a good Western, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's fantastic. And I think a lot, I mean, I can't wait to, I can't wait to see the Obi-Wan Kenobi one when that comes out, you know, yeah. the Rogue Run prequel, all of it. It's just a lot of great stories waiting to be told. Um, j- jumping off a little bit. Have you seen Altered Carbon on Netflix? You know, I saw the first season, and I really, I just haven't gotten around to the second season yet. I'm embarrassed to say. It feels like it has that same kind of thing going on where it's one story now, but I think you're going to start to hear and feel like other stories unfold out of that universe, which is, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm all for more sci-fi. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's some of your influences? Uh, you know, because, so while I was a newspaper reporter, I was primarily uh, towards the end of my time, there was primarily a movie reporter. So I, I think a lot about, like cinematic influences, you know, and then not just about ripping off movies I like or things like that, but like, you know, how, what certain movies did well, like, you know, you take a movie like Memento and the way it was structured, like, you know, can, can that structure be, be used for a different story or, you know, things like that. So I I take it bits and pieces of, you know, movies and things I like, and, um, you know, definitely influences me that way. You know, like a, a prime example would be Rashomon for that uh, Greedo spec script. Right. Uh, you know, that I, I probably don't, I don't know if there's, a, another example is uh, if you read Old Man Hawkeye, the, the second issue, it opens up and Bullseye it has just killed a bunch of people and he's sitting in a dining room and just sort of casually eating and having this conversation with the with the father of the two like adult kids he just killed. And it's all menace. Like, you know, he's going to kill that guy at some point or, you know, just hurt him really badly, but he's like kind of just talking and civilized and that, that tension. And what that was influenced definitely by was uh, the movie *Inglorious bastards. When it opens, Christoph Waltz, who plays this Nazi is in a French farmhouse and he's sitting and just having this conversation with the farmer, knowing that there was this Jewish family in the basement. Right. And, and, so the whole the audience has this tension because they know it's in the basement. They don't know how much he knows. The farmer is like sweating. And so it was that kind of like it's just having this conversation, but you don't know when it's gonna snap. Yeah. And so I want I was really going for that kind of tension. So that's like an example of how it wasn't like the scene itself was directly taken, but I just wanted to capture that tension. Yeah. I love um John Favreau. I think that he everything he touches is like gold yeah. by the way he can do no wrong one of the episodes in the mandalorian i thought one of my favorite uh all time is uh, uh seven samurai or seven Sam- yeah. or samurai seven and i love how that's been told through the anime through the yeah. you know um through the years in different different ways um and uh i believe that one i think one of those episodes had uh a samurai seven you remember the one where he lands on the planet and they, they're attacking from the, yeah. you know, the powers that be attack that little village. And then those guys go out to look for someone to help. And then he recruits a couple of people. It wasn't seven of them, but yeah, you know, it was very I mean, team. They trained the, 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 you know, the villagers and yeah. It, Are you talking yeah. about the, the Mandalorian? Also the clone wars did that too. Oh yeah. Yeah. They did. The, they did uh, an episode with the, with bounty hunters being hired and then, uh, Anakin and uh, Obi Wan were sort of looped in, and I think Kondo was the anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a great premise to work off of, and you can tell like everyone, you know, Filoni and Favreau, they're like they're all film nerds as well as uh, Star Wars nerds, so they you know they definitely. This is the best. Here, bud, why don't you? My, I told my wife to make sure I was not disturbed during the course. No, no. I had a super important person. Yes, this is, this is, uh, hey. Say hi. I see you have a Kansas City chief hi. shirt. Hi. Yep. Are you happy Are you they won? Sure? <laughs> Are you having a good one? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It's got to be um, tough for them to be like, you know, at home the whole time. 
Yeah, Who and and that? so we own, um, you know, uh, <laughs> probably, honey, if you can't control yourself, we're gonna have to excuse you, but you can hang out. Okay. We own um, a place called Pop Rock Cereal Bar and Comic Shop, yep. and so um, they're there often. They're they're learning the business. They're learning about comics, about characters, and he's pretty well rounded in the in the world. Um, and, and that's, you know, knowing that stuff. And so he's, he's a, he's a big Teen Titans fan. Why don't you go that's take good. that in the other room? No, okay. never. <clears throat> so, um, I do have one question from Jason Cox. He wants to know what makes a good comic in your opinion? Oh, I mean, there's so many directions. I think, um, I mean, I think the best comics, whether it's superheroes or others, um, is definitely characters like character driven. It's definitely the, uh... <laughs> I like the map, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I was... no, no worries, no worries. I was just saying that I think like the uh, the common denominator for good comics across whether a crime comic, superhero comics, whatever you know, slice of life comics is that they be character driven. If you don't care about the character, whether it's Spider Man or you know whoever, it's you're just not going to go on that journey and really care whether you know they're in doc ox death trap or whatever like you you have to and i think that was what was great about the the golden age of the marvel comics is like they really hit on that formula where you cared as much about peter parker as you did uh, spider-man so i think the best comics you know you, you really care about the characters that you know you look at look at the mandalorian where you have a character that doesn't really speak much and uh, so, but you, you get like, okay, he's really committed to this code of honor and this, you know, um, this sort of Mandalorian life. And then baby Yoda comes in and he has this protective, you know, he's not just this cold killer. And he, he, you do that without a lot of dialogue, right? He's, right? he's not a character who talks a lot, the Mandalorian. So I kind of feel like you get that there is something more to him than this sort of cold blooded bounty hunter. Um, you know, and I think the best comics and the best movies and the best TV series, uh, they all follow that where, you know, you, you go on a journey and the characters change from the start to the end and you come along for the ride. Sure. Yeah, I love um, I love how good character development, good, good characters, they they develop. You still don't even sometimes know them at the end of this, of yeah. the story. you know, yeah. like there has to be. It's not like you wake, you know, issue, uh, issue one. Here's who I am. Here's my whole story. Yeah. Here, you know, here it goes. It was cool because you thought he was one thing, and then you realize, oh, he was an he was an orphan, and then oh, now that's why he did. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's interesting uh, for sure. And um, can you can you tell tell us anything about what you're working on right now, or what's um, any any fun breaking news for our four watchers? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I wish I could. I will say this, that there are a couple things. On, so, okay. So, obviously, Star Wars Bounty Hunters is uh, the first two issues came out. The third awesome. issue was awesome. awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It is, uh, you know, an ongoing book. So, like, there is more to come on that. Obviously, it was paused. Uh, you know, the issue that was supposed to come out today is not um, for obvious reasons. Uh, I also just wrapping up something called Kiss Zombies. There are a couple of projects I'm working on that I can't talk about at all. There will be one announcement kind of soon, I think, just for an interesting project, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I can't really. Let me let me just verify. Did you say Kiss Zombies or Kids? Kiss Kiss Zombies, like the band, the rock okay, band. Okay, right. And sure. whatever whatever is in your mind right now is exactly what it is. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, well. Yeah. That's um, for dynamite. Yeah, I don't really have a lot much, uh, too much more for you. If anybody has any questions, man, please ask um, before we wrap this thing up. But um, the goal here, um, my wife started a program at, at Pop Rock that was our comic creator series, and what we did is we asked local comic creators to come in and really kind of, kind of chop up what a comic book is, the character development, the world development, how to, you know, paneling, the drawing. Really, and it was a four-part series. And we wanted to try to create something, especially now since we can't gather together, where we could start to these these young comic creators can get together um, here, wherever it may be, um, and 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 you know just sort of learn from what you older people. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what we're doing, what you're doing, um, and and see, you know, I mean, one of the things that I uh, when we started the the comic shop, the one one of the things that we did was we created what we called our comic discovery program, mm -hmm. and it's basically a membership where you spend you you it, you know ten dollars a month, and you get to come in and read all the comic books you want without having oh, cool. to actually buy them. And the reason we did that is so you could discover new books that you might not normally have read and then yeah. you know, get you hooked. Um, but also we just really believe in the, and I know that this eventually, eventually um, at some point uh, will we'll shift more and more, but you know, we, we want to make sure, because what, what I was seeing was a lot of people stealing comic books, right? Pirating comic books online. And I just thought like guys like you, you know, who have a passion and have a real um, um, special ability to be able to tell a story. In your case, um, some draw, some do whatever, but, but, and maybe this wasn't something you wanted to do your whole life, or maybe it was, but either way, you have invested so much time and energy into this and for the people just to take and yeah. not, you know, and so we thought, how do we keep, how do we change that mindset? And we're able to get still, because th really the end user isn't always, I mean, if you walk into a comic book shop, another thing we do, by the way, is as uh, our comics, when they sit on the shelf for uh, six months or more, we donate them to the Golisano Children's Hospital. Oh, so constantly trying to get them out into the hands of actual yeah. people. But more importantly, I, I believe that retailers like us are really what's driving the, the I mean, if we were walking to a comic shop, nobody orders exactly how many comic books they need for their pull list. Mm -hmm. There's always extra. There's always more. Yeah. And how can we get those out there? And so how do we keep the retail world alive? Because I think that there is uh, um, as much as comics are are a part of our lives. I think that retailers it's not like I'm, people are waking up and saying, hey, I want to I'm going to open a comic shop today. People want to open, you know, a Dunkin Donuts or a McDonald's before they want to open. A, a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we're trying to find ways to bridge that gap. And um, and so anyways, we want people to start thinking about, you know, what it's like to be a comic creator, what what's involved. And I really appreciate you coming on to just share your story. Yeah. Do you have any, um, you know, any guidance or anything you might say to a young person watching who wants to get into the business? Yeah, I mean, so it's it's sort of I see that there's a question from Jesse. Um, you always wanted to be a comic book artist. And I think writers and artists have two different paths. The thing with artists is, you know, if you do a portfolio, a talent scout, and a lot of them go to the comic conventions like Ricky Purden for Marvel and other people, um, and they sometimes, you know, schedule portfolio reviews. If you have physical art that you can show them, um, they'll get a sense of, and the most important thing is not like how great and how photorealistic you, realistically you draw. It's really how you can tell a serialized story. Like you can tell a story over several because that is like the thing they look for from artists. It's like, are you a storyteller? Not, or can you just do an awesome, you know, they do look for cover artists and stuff like that. But like, if you really want to be an artist in the business, you need to be able to tell that kind of story. Like that's sort of serialized, uh, sequential is the word I'm looking for. Like the sequential art. Um, for writers, unfortunately, it's not just about you bringing a script in. Uh, I was lucky, but my luck was because I had been in a different kind of business that had that connection for 20 years. So they knew me as a writer for, you know, newspapers. Um, but for the most part, you can't just write a script and say, I'm going to send this to Marvel. This is the greatest idea for like a crossover or whatever. First of all, they're not going to read your script. They can't because if they read it and take or and have an idea or had an idea that was kind of similar, then they're going to worry that you're going to sue them. You know what I mean? So they don't even look at it. Like if you send an unsolicited script, it will not be read. So that's not the way in. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut. It's kind of like, Hey, I want to play shortstop for the, for the Yankees. Well, in order to play shortstop for the Yankees, you got to play high school ball first. You got to play, you know, maybe college, got to go to the minor leagues. And then, um, you know, it's a little easier with comics because what you start to do and a lot of people you look at like, uh, some of the greats that are currently working now, like the Matt Rosenbergs and the, you know, um, uh, Kelly Thompson's and all these people like that, they started out indie comics, you know, maybe in some cases they self-published, maybe they, you know, taught, like met with different people and tried to do 
like web comics or anthology stories or things like that. You got to show something finished that you've done and, you know, and then maybe work, you know, work your way up. There are a lot of great companies doing a lot of great work, but at the same time, you also have to, you know, uh, to get to any, into any of them, you have to be able to show that you've done something that something like has come out and, and, you know, how, how you write that way. So unfortunately for writers, it's a lot harder to do that without, you know, breaking in at some level first. Mm. So I think like, you know, now there are all these great digital tools, there's Kickstarter, there's all these things. So if you can self publish something and if it's, you know, good enough to catch the eye of somebody at, a, at another company and then you work your way up. Um, and the other thing too, is like a lot of people found success on the creator owned side, not working for Marvel or DC, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, um, there are uh, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of ways in, but all of them involve a lot of hustling and work before there's any credit and success. It's very right. rare that, you know, uh, I'm really not a typical model. I was very lucky, but also, you know, some of that luck was because of work I had done previously. So it wasn't, Positioning. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't like someone waved a magic wand and, you know, it, it came. So, uh, you know, it's worth, it's, if it's really your passion, um, you have to work at it a lot and be prepared to get a lot of no's before you get a yes, like anything worth doing, you know, it's not easy. Sounds a lot like acting. Go out yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, it kind of is, you know. Um, do your community theater, do your, you know, yeah, do a commercial, you know. Yeah, and, exactly, uh, exactly. And just keep showing up when, you know. You know, and, and being writing. being a writer is also kind of like being a movie director where you're not going to get a Marvel movie right out of film school. You know what I mean? Like you've got to right. show, you've got to do that short. You've got to take that short and like, get an independent, you know, uh, project. And then that independent project, maybe you get like a small budget studio movie. And then from there, you know what I mean? Yeah. You go to the Marvel movie. Yeah. Very cool. Ethan, check your schedule. So, um, I don't know how the world is going to look, but we throw a, we throw a, um, a comic con here in Rochester. It's called super city. We did our first one last year. Mm -hmm. And, um, the idea is it's basically, um, it's spread out. It's open air. Um, mm -hmm. It's indoor, outdoor. So the idea really spawned from two things. The first one was going to New York City Comic Con this past year, and it was packed. Uh, I've tried to bring my kids. Absolutely, we just it was not a good time. It just you know, if I'm there, I'm six foot five, two fifty. I can navigate through. I can see yeah. what I want. You know, but you know, standing in lines for hours and doing all that, it just it wasn't really a, an enjoyable experience. And so we wanted an opportunity to really um, spread it out and give and, and make it more of a uh, of a um, I don't know an experience. You know, that that where you don't walk through a front door. And the other thing was based on um, we have a heart for 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 everybody really, but but. Um, how do low income families, how do kids who need access to superheroes get access? Movies cost yeah. money, Netflix cost money, comics cost money, comic cons cost money. So we wanted something that was totally free, um, at least free in the sense that you can come in and, and interact. Yeah, there's, no admission, there's no admission charge. Yeah, Honestly, exactly. If you, want, so, if you want to buy something, it's something else. But yeah. Right. But we had free concerts. We had yeah. free, you know, we did gaming on the dome of a planetarium. Mm -hmm. We played video games on the dome of a planetarium, wow, totally free. Cool. We showed um, Transformers. Really the cool. 80s. Yeah, it was the only way to play video games, by the way. <laughs> uh, we showed the 80s Transformers movie for free. We showed um, in a movie theater. We showed um, cartoons all day in a movie theater for free. So we did a lot of stuff to get people to, to come out and, and hang out. So anyways, um, we decided this year we're going to go Labor Day weekend. And we think really this is a great alternative to the average. Uh, we're also, by the way, in Rochester is the National Toy Hall of Fame, the um, amazing toy museum that we have here. And we've partnered with them this year to provide something really special. But um, it's Labor Day weekend. And if your schedule's open, I'd like to talk to you about maybe having you come out. But All right, we can let's, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, let's see where we're at, too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'd yeah, 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 yeah. love to check that out. Yeah. Uh, 
But I think it's an alternative too, especially with the social distance, you know, because people don't want to be crowded. I don't think we're going to be able to to be crowded in a, in a space, in one place, like a yeah, convention have, center. For no a long idea. Time. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think you put, oh, you know, I, I don't think anyone really knows that yet. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. Last, last one. What comics are you reading? Any recommendations? Yeah, I mean, um, I think one of the uh, one of the um, uh, one thing I recommend is Four Kids Walking in the Bank, uh, Walking to a Bank. The uh, Matt Rosenberg and Tyler Bosses. Uh, it's in trade yeah. now. It's really good. It's a really good, funny. Uh, it feels like a like an Amblin movie, um, like an Amblin movie meets Goodfellas. I don't know how else to or or yeah. It just has that kind of crime, but also fun. Uh, feel more recently i love uh the plot vault comics uh the first trade is out it's a very good uh very good horror comic um more kids walk in a i just saw this it's on my list a, walk into a bank and uh and uh oh uh so yeah the the plot which is vault comics uh it's collected the first uh trade is just out now um uh -huh. and then um uh just brand new there's uh plunge joe, joe hill it's uh he has a new line out of comics out and that uh the uh plunge is is just an awesome book i also i read every like almost every marvel comic uh you know i'm obviously biased uh but the the stuff that's going on in the star wars line um oh, and the, the star wars and, stuff, yeah, yeah and the x-men line on top of that too like and just vader so was has been so good everything yeah. that's star wars right now is Home run. I, I joke because like right now there are four main Star Wars titles. Uh, so Bounty Hunters is one of them. That's the one I do. But there's Star Wars, which is by uh, written by Greg. Uh, sorry, is written by Charles Soule. Vader, which is written by Greg Pak. Uh, and then Doctor Afra, uh, which is coming out, which is uh, written by Alyssa Wong. And I always joke that I'm Ringo in that band. <laughs> you know, it's so got, got all like these great musicians and like kind sure. of, uh, no, no offense to Ringo Starr, but. Um, Offense to Ringo. Yeah, I don't always. I always say like, you know, I'm I'm Ringo, and then they point out like you're saying that because he's like one of the ones who's who's still alive. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. cool. Anyway. All right, so I I pop those up in here. I'm actually going to check out a couple of these myself. I'm while in isolation. I've had to. I'm digging deep into the independence and some of the other stuff. Like that. Even some of the Marvel and DC that I normally wouldn't have read. Um, and I've got some, I've got people who normally come in for polls and stuff. And I'm like, since there's nothing, why don't you try this thing you, you've been yeah. avoiding, you know? Um, so cool. All right, man. Well, listen, Ethan, it was a real pleasure having you on. Thank I really you. appreciate Thank you for taking the time everybody. and thank you for continuing yeah. to, you know, to work hard at a time when it's really tough. So, uh, we'll get through it. Just, you know, um, unfortunately we have to make it through these next few weeks first, but we will yeah. get through it. Cool. All right, Ethan, thank you so much. No we appreciate you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Support your LCS. Yes. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. All right. I, uh,